through the retina to actually get back to the brain, which is why we have a blind spot. And then if you were to build a robot with circuitry, how would you do it? The first layer of processing would be right next to the sensor, sensor. Uh, the next one would be behind it and so on. It would be going depth-wise. No, that's not what happens in our brain. Your eyes connect to the very back of your head. And that's where your visual processing begins, and then it travels forward, which is kind of strange. So in the case of the cats, in case of cats, the, it would be a uh, place where uh, the images are first sensed in the human brain is the V1 cortex, it's at the back of the head. The equivalent for cats is the striate cortex. So called because the neurons are striated. And Hubel and Wiesel studied these back in 59. Their study involved 24 cats, anesthetized, immobilized on artificial respirators. They were anesthetized with truth serum, so I assume that anything the cat said was true. <laughs> and uh, they had electrodes in the cat's brain. Now, for the soft-hearted amongst us, they don't actually report if they ever killed the cat, but then they say that afterwards the brain study was tissue, brain tissue was studied. So they leave that to our imagination. Now, yes. Professor, this screen isn't being shared right now, so the students on Zoom can't really access it, so we're sort of hearing that setup. Okay. okay. So uh, for the first few slides, they're kind of maybe not so, such a big deal. But uh, so here is the experiment they ran on the anesthetized cats. They kept the eyes open, and they beamed lights of different wavelengths into the eye on the retina through these fully open iris. And this defines the, and then they, took readings off the back of the head, off, the stri off neurons in the striate cortex. The lights themselves are aware of different wavelengths. They started with a spot which they moved in different directions to see how uh, the cell responded to light in different positions. And what they found was something of this kind. They said that any given neuron didn't respond to images all over the uh, eye. It responded to uh, stimuli in specific locations on the retina. And even there, it had patterns where if light fell on some regions of the retina, then the neuron would not fire, regardless of what else was shown on the eye. And there were places where the light could fall and there would be high response. So when you actually map them out, the patterns of response for each neuron were something of this kind. They were linear and they were oriented along different directions. This pattern is what they call the receptive field of the neuron. So basically what you see is that each neuron responds to kind of linear patterns. They're like edge detectors. Yeah. So over here, they are the blue patterns, the, the blue patches show the directions along which the neuron responded. These are the excitatory uh, regions of the retina. And the red patches are the inhibitory regions. If light falls on the red patches, there is no response, regardless of what falls in the blue patch. And the way they did it was uh, they'd actually move the spot of light along different orientations and see how many spikes they got off the neurons. So in this particular experiment, you can see that when the light is moving horizontally, there is no response. As they keep rotating the light, when it's vertical is when you get the most response. And then when it continues to rotate, the response goes down again. And this is regardless of whether you have a full uh, scan or just a half scan. So what this seems to indicate is that oriented slits of light are the most effective stimuli for neurons in the striate cortex. And one assumes that this also holds for human brains. And then in a later paper, they showed that within the striate cortex, there are actually two levels of processing called, uh, the first level of processing is what, what they call simple or S uh, cells. And the second level of processing was performed by what they call complex or C cells. And both types of cells responded to oriented slits of light. But complex cells, but uh, the simple cells tended to get confused by noise. The complex cells did not. And the reason for this was uh, explained as follows. The simple cells, shown down here, connected to a collection of uh, neurons in the retina. Now, each neuron in the, each sensor in the retina responds to a somewhat circular pattern of light. But the cell itself was connected to a linear arrangement of these sensors. 
which is why it had a linear, uh, which is why it oriented, which uh, it responded to linear patterns. But then the C cells, the S cells, the simple cells are somewhat sensitive, and so they can get fooled by noise. The C cells would connect to multiple S cells. So over here, each of these vertical lines shows the response of one S cell. It has a vertical orientation in this example. And the C cell would sort of pick the maximum of the responses of all the S cells they were connected to. So they were sort of cleaning up the response of the S cells. S for simple, C for complex. And so they find that complex C cells build from similarly oriented simple cells. They fine tune the response of the simple cell. And then they also found that there's a hierarchical buildup, that the response of the C cell is fed to other S cells, which, which respond to patterns of excitation from, within the C cells. And those in turn are cleaned up by uh, the next layer of C cells and so on. So as you go through these layers of processing, they found that the kind of patterns that these cells respond to become more and more complex. So this was the first real study of how the human brain or neurons in the human brain respond to uh, visual stimuli. And so the idea seems to be that at the, the first level of processing responds to kind of oriented uh, patterns and these, the, and within each layer of process, processing, there are two stages. There are the S cells, which respond to patterns. The C cells, which aggregate groups of S cells and pick the largest value to clean up these responses. And then this builds up over layers. And as you go through the layers, the patterns that these cells respond to become more and more complex. Eventually, of course, their uh, experiments became more and more gory. They began working with monkeys and, uh, yeah. And so at this point, I stopped reading their papers. But anyway, and of course, to add insult to injury, they say this model cannot, however, accommodate the color, spatial frequency, and many other features to which neurons are tuned. The exact organization of all these cortical columns within V1 remains a hot topic of current yes. research. This was 1959, 1962. But anyway, the study, at least they claim, doesn't really generalize, but kind of conveys the idea of how things respond and gives us something that we can begin modeling. And so that gives us our first poll. Ah, oh, today's a cheetah. There's a teal cheetah. What happened here? So who's teal cheetah? On Zoom, yeah. On Zoom. Can you see the slides, guys? On Zoom? Okay. So what yeah. is the response here? Yeah. Uh, it's the first option. First one, S cells find patterns and C cells in the map, right? Oh, okay, thank you. So moving on, that was 1959, 1960. We fast forward something like 20 years, we end up with this guy, Kunohiko Fukushima, who realized that yes, the Google and Visual model just give us an, an explanation of how the visual cortex responds, but it's not complete. For example, it doesn't explain the grandmother cell phenomenon. Has anybody heard about this? Have you heard about the Jennifer neuron, Aniston neuron? So, so there's a famous, there was a famous nature paper on this. It turns out, you know, Epileptic people usually have lesions on the brain. And so one of the treatments is that they actually open their skulls up. And I don't know, I suppose they perform surgery on these lesions. But for a while, these guys are lying there in the hospital with their skull open, at which point people like us, well, not quite like us, go there and run experiments on them like guinea pigs. And one of the things they do is they put a mesh of uh, sensors on the exposed portion, portion of the brain and they can see how it responds to different stimuli. And so in this particular experiment, they were trying to study the visual stimulus, the responses to visual stimulus on a, a patient, and they found that there was a particular neuron that only ever fired when this guy was shown a picture of Jennifer Aniston. So this is the famous Jennifer Aniston neuron. Now, 
There's nothing special about Jennifer Aniston. Each of us, it turns out, has neurons devoted to maybe not Jennifer Aniston, but different people. We recognize specific, uh, you know, specific faces uh, result in responses in specific uh, neurons, in fact, specific patterns too. But what is important is that the location of this uh, trigger does not matter. So you have a neuron that always fires when you see your grandmother. It doesn't matter, matter whether granny is off to the right of the, image, of, the, of the scene or whether it's, she's off to the left. If grandma is in the scene, that neuron will fire. And this is something that uh, Ubel and Wiesel didn't quite capture. So Fukushima came up with a computational model for based on Ubel and Wiesel's studies. And he factored in the grandmother neuron phenomena. So this was his model. It's called the neocognitron. So based on the name that neocognitron, I'm assuming that prior to the neocognitron, there was a cognitron. And so this is the newer version. And he modeled the visual system as consisting of a hierarchy of modules. Within each module, you have two layers. One is a layer of S cells corresponding to uh, Hubble and Wiesel's simple cells. And a layer of C cells corresponding to the complex cells. S cells respond to signals from the previous layer. So within each module, the S cells respond to the stimuli uh, from the C cells of the previous layer. And within each module, the C cells operate on the output of the S cells. Now, what do these modules themselves look like? Within each module, he found that uh, he sort of hypothesized that there are several planes of sets. And within each plane are several neurons. So let's chop this So he had different planes, and within each plane, you have several cells. And all of the cells have exactly the same response. So if, say, this cell responds to patterns which are oriented like this, so does every, cell, every other cell in the plane. And you have many such planes. So you might have, within, a, within an S plane, different, uh, within an S layer, different planes. And this guy might, for example, respond to these patterns, this might respond to something like a circle, this might respond to something, the cells here might respond to something like a horizontal line. And then these were the S cells. And then corresponding to each one of these, you had a C layer. And the way these were set up was that each S cell, starting from the uh, retina, the S cells in the retina are looked at the S cells in the first layer looked at the retina. And each neuron over here would look at a different portion of the retina. So this might look here, this guy, this might look here, this might look here, and so on. But they're all responding to the same pattern, right? And then within the C cell, of course, each cell over here looks at a region within the corresponding S cell, uh, the, the S plane and uh, aggregates it to clean up the response in some manner. So this was one layer. And then the second layer had much this, uh, the same response, except that now, so once you get here, what you have is that, uh, let me just draw these closer. So these would be your C layers. So say, let's say this one fires for, for, for Circles, this one fires for something like this kind. This one fires for the for uh, oriented suits of this kind. The next one fires for oriented suits of this kind. So these C cells are cleaning up the corresponding S cell responses. So these C cell responses would also be for circles, horizontal lines, and things of this kind, right? Yeah. So is it acting as like a max pool? Over no, the C cell is, the C -cell. It, it's not exactly a max pool, we'll get to that. And this would be one layer. Then in the next layer, 
you have similarly a collection of S planes, and with each S plane, you have many neurons which all have identical response. And each neuron now looks at some region, the same region within the within all of the S C plates of the previous layer. So, for example, this guy might put together circles, horizontal lines, and angular lines and respond to stick back, stick figures, right? Except that each component is coming from a different S plane. And so, uh, so also this guy would be responding uh, to other, other combinations of these patterns and so on. So uh, you have this hierarchy where after the first layer, each S plane has, S layer has many planes. Within each plane, you have many cells which are identical in response. And each cell is looking at all of the C plates of the previous layer together to compose the pattern that it's actually going to respond to. And then each S plane is followed by a C plane, which kind of cleans up the response. So uh, they actually, uh, Fukushima actually came up with a mathematical formula for how each S cell responds. So this S cell would have some response to all of these guys. So what is the nature of the response? He had a formula for it. Then the corresponding C cell is going to be looking at regions over here and cleaning things up. How does it combine those to come up with its own response? He had a formula for it. Only the S cell is plastic, meaning on, only the S cell has parameters that can be learned. The C cell is not plastic. It has a fixed response. It, op or it always operates in the same manner. Now, these formulae formula look ugly. Back in 1980, they might have looked very profound and uh, you know, uh, deep. But then if you look at them really clearly, uh, closely, uh, the one on top actually looks like a relu. The one at the bottom also looks like a relu, but you can sort of approximate it as a max. Now, as you go through the layers, the initial layers would be look, responding to simple patterns. The next layer would be responding to combinations of these simple patterns, right? The layer after that is going to be, which is more complex. The layer after that is going to be responding to combinations of those patterns. So as you go through the layers, the patterns that the uh, neurons respond to become more and more complex. He also gave us a, a uh, learning uh, paradigm for this, which is like so. Now, if you have all the layers in the S plane, you can sort of stack them up in a, uh, so that it looks more like a cuboid, right? And he, his uh, learning model was unsupervised, meaning there was no uh, label. It just learned from exposure to data, which is basically what uh, you know, early responses of the human vision is going to be like too, right? And the way it happens is that if you go across, let's say uh, you have this portion over here, now, each at any particular location, you have responses from all of these planes, and all of these guys might be looking at a specific region in the previous plane. You would pick the response that was the largest. So let's say this was the largest. Then you're not going to do anything here. You just use heavier learning to increase this weight. But then once you increase that weight, you're going to share that increased weight across all of the neurons within the plane. Very simple. Learning, uh, learning model. And of course, for the C planes, it's just a max, right? So you don't really care. So what happens is that although only one of these planes picks up a particular location here and increments its, weight, increments its weight, if you go across all of the planes, each plane may pick up, a, pick up a response from a different location. And so eventually all of the planes actually get updated. Does that make sense? Uh, and the actual learning is heavy. And here's what he found. If you implement this very simple learning paradigm, you end up with something like this. If you present this system with lots of images of characters, for instance, you might find that the earliest layer begins to capture all of the vertical and horizontal lines that compose the characters. As you go through the layers, they begin more forming more and more complex patterns. By the time you get to the last layer, the neurons are actually responding to entire characters. So it automatically performs some kind of clustering. So in this example, 
the model was presented with lots of examples of digits. And the different S planes in the final layer, that's the different C planes in the final layer of this model. Each has ended up responding to a different digit. So one of them only responded to the digit zero, the other only responded to the digit one. And this was even though the images themselves might have noise. So it's a very cool uh, example of a computational model of how our visual system might be learning to capture patterns in an unsupervised manner. And it also gave us a computational model. But then it's missing something, right? The entire thing is unsupervised, yes. No, no. So how can one attach supervision to something of this kind? Any ideas? Thank you. So. Simple question. So, who's Corel Wolf? Corel Wolf is that? Here, uh, first one is true. First one is true. Okay, thank you. And who's Bronze Llama? Bronze Llama, that's it. Okay. And who's Scarlet Bear? Scarlet Bear, you hear? Uh, here. So here, I'm on Zoom. Uh, true. You also? Thank you. Everybody agree with those? So Fukushima's model is basically an unsupervised convolutional neural network, which means you can add supervision to it, right? So the near drawn is fully unsupervised. Semantic labels are automatically learned. You just sort of do this unsupervised learning, and somehow each neuron in the final layer learns to respond to a different kind of pattern. But can we add external supervision? As Josh Mint said, the answer is yes. And uh, in the late 80s, Lots of people uh, came up with models. So, Palmer Atlas in Marx did one in 88. Uh, Alex Weibel over here uh, and uh, Kevin Bang. They came up with time delay neural networks, which is another example of, uh, of uh, adding supervision to Fukushima's model. And Jan Lekun did this for two dimensional versions of the same model. Of course, of the three, Jan Lekun's model became most famous, but they all were pretty much co you know. Coeval, they all came up with this ideas independently at the same time. And in fact, maybe the first paper to actually have won, a, won an award for adding supervision to uh, Fukushima's model might be Weibel's TDNM paper in 1989. Now, so how do you do this? You actually add, as Josh Min said, a softmax layer after the final C layer. So, the final C layer is going to collect, compute a bunch of different values. You can take the entire lot of them and put them through a softmax. Now, and then you have an actual classific classification. You can provide examples of positive and negative instances and just train your model, right? So, and that can be done using simple back backdrop. Now, one thing to note, the original Fukushima model actually uses many copies of the same neuron. So when you have a plane of this kind, you have many copies of the same neuron with different responses, and each copy looks at a different location of the input. So instead of having many explicit copies, it just makes sense to have a single copy scan, and the effect is the same. So uh, in, the, uh, in the original implementation of all of these, and all implementations of uh, supervised versions of the Fukushima model, we actually perform scanning. Now, in the mathematical implementations that did come up, we, there were some other small modifications. In Fukushima's original model, the receptive field for each neuron was elliptical, which is kind of a pain to deal with. So they changed that into rectangular or square receptive fields. Secondly, uh, uh, they uh, also included something that is, again, 
derived from the original model that the S plane responds to all the inputs. Cells in the C plane are responding to regions from the S plane, which means that this entire region is accounted for. So the next cell in the C plane would actually be looking at a region which didn't overlap very much with the region that the first cell looked at. So which means that the C planes keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller as you go through tile, go through the layers. And to, to compensate for it, you would increase the number of planes within the, within the next S layer, within each S layer. So uh, as you go through the uh, model, the C cells, the scanning in the C cells tried by more than just one pixel value, and they keep getting smaller. So that, and here's the math. Within each uh, S layer, the neurons would have a response of this kind. The, uh, each neuron is going to first compute an affine function of all of the regions that it's responding to in the previous layer. So if you look at any particular neuron over here, the response is going to be an affine function of all of these pixels, all of these values output by the previous layer. And then you apply an activation to it, shown by sigma. And then when you have a C cell, the C cell guy is simply going to look at, so observe that S cells look at all of the planes in the previous layer. C cells only look at one plane within the same, same layer, and they're only going to pick up the, some largest response within the small region. So uh, this is kind of identical to scanning with a neuron, as we saw in the last class. And this was uh, Jan Lecun's Turing Award-winning work from 1989. So back in the day, the US Postal Service had a problem. Everybody sent mail, and they would write down addresses, and you needed people to actually scan these things to decide where each thing went, and they wanted to automate the process. So say they, they actually invested some money in trying to get automated systems to read these handwritten addresses. And Jan Lecun built the uh, first neural network based system. You can, he's, I think he still has the demo up on his website. He's about 30 years old at this point. And it could do a pretty darn good job of recognizing the digits as you scan them. Now, exam, again, observe how it is location invariant. So, uh, now, so the story so far mammalian, the mammalian visual cortex contains S cells which capture oriented visual patterns, and C cells, which perform major, computer majority vote over groups of S cells. The new cognitron emulates this behavior with planar blanks of uh, bags of C and S and C cells with identical responses to enable shift in variance. And Lecun's LANET added external supervision to the neocognitron to actually uh, give us a supervised version of this model. Now we're gonna spend the rest of this lecture sort of looking into this model a little bit. So here's what a convolutional neural network looks like. It has a con collection of convolutional layers, which are basically scanning layers where the, uh, which, which, which consist of neurons, which, which uh, simultaneously scan all of the maps in the previous layer. And then pooling layers, which look at small regions of the uh, corresponding planes, S planes, to aggregate the response, to get a cleaner response. And the, the response itself, so of these, only the convolution layers have learnable parameters. The final layer, the, fi the final uh, pulling layer may be followed by a multi-layer perceptron, which looks at all of the uh, outputs of the uh, final C layer to come up with its response. Now, what does a convolution layer look like? A convolution layer consists of a series of maps corresponding to the S planes in the neocognitron, and they can be called feature maps or activation maps. And within that map, there are actually two operations going on. First, there's an affine value computed from all of the values in the previous layer. And then there's an activation applied to it. So I'm going to call it the affine map. The first thing, uh, this, uh, this guy here, uh, I will call it affine map, which is learned, which is basically a bunch of affine values computed from 
the previous layer. And the weights have what we will call a learnable filter. The affine, the affine map is then uh, converted to an activation map by applying an activation function to every element in the affine map. Now, what does the affine map itself look like? If I look at any particular affine map over here, it is obtained by <coughs> simultaneously scanning all of the previous layers, right? So let's look at basically all the maps in the previous layer can contribute to the convolution process, the scanning to a computer corresponding affine map. Now, to see how this is done, let's consider the contribution of any one single layer over here. So the highlighted yellow map is what I'm trying to compute. And I'm, going, I'm showing what the highlighted orange map contributes to it. So here is the picture. This one, I'm not sure where I borrowed it from, but it's something on the web. That must be true. Uh, the figure to the left shows this orange map on top. And the, uh, now, when I'm trying to scan it, I'm going to have a set of weights. So here, for example, if I am scanning If I'm trying to compute a response in this layer, I have many different planes from the previous layer. So to compute the location over here, I'm going to be looking at all of these values from the, from the planes in the previous layer and corresponding to each location, there would be a weight. The set of weights is what we call a filter. And so what the figure shows over there in orange is the set of weights associated with one of these guys. There will also be a bias because it's an affine function, right? And the way you would do it, all values shown here are uh, binary simply for purposes of illustration. So you would place the filter shown by the little red numbers on top of the map uh, in green. And then at each location, you're going to be multiplying the map value which is the black number with the corresponding filter value, the red number, and then summing over the entire region. And then you're also adding the bias, and that's going to give you the value at one position. And so you'd continue doing that across the uh, input, and at each position, you're going to repeat the same operation. So that is going to be the contribution of just one of these maps to the final output map. Now, uh, this, this is the contribution of one map, right? In reality, that one highlighted yellow map is going to be computed from all of these guys, from all of these orange maps. So this picture here shows each of the orange maps. This guy here shows the highlighted yellow map. So in order to compute the highlighted yellow map, you would have a filter which has a set of weights associated with every, you know, every plane, right? So the weights would have some structure of this kind, the color, the color code shows that all of the numbers can be different, right? And in order to compute the values in the output map, we would place the filter on the top left corner like so and compute the inner product, which is a component-wise product and a sum. And that's going to give you the top left corner of the output map. Then you could move forward by one step and repeat the computation and keep doing this computation as you go top left to bottom left. Right? Very simple computation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so that's going to give you your affine map. So here is the formula. You're going to be scale summing over all of the planes. The sum, the, that, that is the M. Within each plane, you're summing over the square region. So you have two axes, K and L. And within each region, you're multiplying the weight by the underlying uh, map value. And then you're summing the whole thing up. So this is just for one filter, right? One filter is going to give you one plane. If you want a second plane, the second plane is going to have a second filter completely different associated with it. And this second filter is what is going to be placed on top of the uh, input maps and, and your scan to compute the second plane. And so corresponding to each of the output planes, you'll have one such filter. For the operation, yeah. It's, we're, we're calling this entire, oh good God, what did I do? So we are calling this 
entire, this is what happens when you have too many pictures. Uh, this entire arrangement. So all M of them, you know, all M squares together, a single filter, right? So did, did, did this make sense to everybody? Right, the filter itself has many planes, which we will call channels. But within each channel, you have a square, square arrangement of weights. Uh, Any questions on Zoom? Okay, right. So I can redraw, redraw that somewhat differently. Instead of drawing all the planes one below the other, I can stack them up and arrange them like a cube. So over here, uh, you see all of the orange planes. Those orange planes in the cube are just the orange planes on the, on, uh, to the extreme left in this picture. So now this cube, when I visualize them in this manner, then the filter also becomes a little cuboid. And so the way I would be performing my computation is to place the cuboid on this arranged set of planes. And within each plane, I'm summing over that face, the, uh, the highlighted yellow face, and performing a component-wise product and summing the lot. And I'll be doing this across all of the planes. And so that's going to give me one value. And then I can scan with this guy, going top left to bottom right, to compute the, compute the entire set of output values. Does this visualization make sense to you guys? Right. So very simple, right? So uh, enough. How big is the actual computation itself? Now, if you look over here, there are, the input is five cross five, right? The filter is three cross three. If I say that the filter cannot go beyond the edge of the input, how many, uh, how many columns will the output have? Three, right? So more generally, if I have something of this kind and if this input is with M and the filter is with M, so this is one, this is going to be n minus m steps, correct? So I have this one position, and then I can have an additional n minus one shifts. So the output is going to give me n minus m plus one. This n minus m corresponds to this one, and this plus one corresponds to the initial position. So uh, general, so when I actually have a uh, n cross n input and an m cross m filter, then the output is going to be n minus m plus one cross n minus m plus one. So even if you're stepping one step at a time, you will lose things at the boundaries. Now, so for a simple convolution, the output on each side is going to be n minus m plus one, assuming you're not allowed to go beyond the edge of the input, which results in a reduction in the output size. So in some cases, you might want the output to be have the same size as the input or at least be proportional in size as the input. And if you want to do that, that means that in order to ensure that the output is also size n cross n, you must add m minus one, uh, you must add the output with m minus one zeros. And so typically what we will do is to arrange a bunch of zeros symmetrically on all sides of the input so that now when you, when you now scan, the output is exactly n cross n. Right? This is a design choice. You're not actually get, adding too much, sorry. You're not adding extra information, but you're just adding zeros. Now, the convolution results in an affine map. This is just the computation of affine values using these filters. Once the affine map is computed, the next thing you will do is to apply an activation so here is the affine map computation and the code. You'll be scanning left to right. At each point, you're sort of pulling out a 3D block from the layer. If I had to think of all of them as arranged as a cuboid, right? And then you have a comp you compute an inner product of this 3D block with your weights, assuming that the, the weights are also arranged as a cuboid. And then the next thing you perform is to apply an activation of this output. So you compute and once the affine map is computed, you're going to apply an activation to it to get the actual output of the layer. So here's the summary of convolution. Convolution layer scan the input using a bank of filters. The filter is just a neuron in the scanning layer. Each filter jointly scans the maps in the previous layer to produce an output map. There are going to be as many 
output maps as filters, regardless of the number of input maps. We have to pad the edges to ensure that the output maps are the same size as the input maps. Right. Now, if not convolution, we'll use layers, uh, rows and columns at the edge of the scan. Now, the other set of operations are the pooling operations. Now, observe how a convolution looked at all of the, all of the layers, which we often also call channels in the previous layer. Pooling is just going to be aggregating a bunch of values within a single channel to sort of clean up the response. And typically, it's just max pooling. So what is exactly is it? You'll be going within a channel, and the pooling operation is going to be looking at a small region, typically also square. And within that region, it will pick the largest value. For example, here, if within that little square, that four values were three, one, four, and six, the largest value is six. So the output is going to be six. And then you go forward one, and here the values are one, six, three, and five. Again, the largest value is six, so it's going to be picking up six, and so on. You perform this operation going left to right, top to bottom, at each point, just picking up the largest value within the window and uh, outputting it. Now, the way I've shown it, pooling is just a regular operation. It's also a scan, except that the operation you're performing, think of it as having a max uh, operation as your activation. Now, in the picture itself, I've shown the pooling happening with a stride of one. Whereas earlier, we said that when pooling happens, Pooling typically takes a stride greater than one. For, com for conceptual purposes, it doesn't make sense to think of strides greater than one because when we think of uh, how derivatives are computed and how backpropagation is done, that can really foul up matters. So it's much simpler to always think of all scanning operations being performed with a stride of one. Right? Does that make sense? And of course, pooling can have different formats. So the most common one is the, is the max pooling, where at each location, you first find the index of the location of the largest value, and then copy the value from this, from this location to the output. Now, you could directly just perform a max, but that, has, that causes problems when you're performing backdrop. So the way we will do it is to find the index, the location of the largest value, and then copy the value at that location to the output. But instead of max, we can also have mean pooling, where at each, at each point, instead of picking the largest of the input values, you just pick the mean of the input values. So here, for example, 1, 1, 5, and 6, the mean is 3.25. So the output would be 3.25, right? And the pseudocode for this is simpler, because you don't have to pick up the log, you know, find the index, and then read the value. You just compute the mean. Or you can have other kinds of pooling operations, like computing a p-norm, or even having an entire little neural network, which replaces the uh, pooling operation, which looks at all of these values and outputs a single value. This was, often, this was called a network in network architecture back in the day. So pooling layers scan the input using a pooling operation, typically by selecting a max from a K cross K lockup input. Each pooling filter scans an individual map in the previous layer to produce an output pooled map. So again, convolution looked at all of the channels together. Pooling looks at just a single channel. And for pooling, we generally do not pad the edges because adding zeros at the edges doesn't really make sense when you're doing performing operations like picking the max, right? So, so far, we have only considered layers where the output size is approximately equal to the input size, modulo sum, boundary effects. But then, there are other operations we can do. We can perform operations which change the size of the input. So the two most common ones are the two ones. The two ways in which you can change the size of the input is to shrink the input or increase the size of the input. Shrinking the input is what we call downsampling. To shrink the input, all you do is to throw away a layer. So for example, if I have an input over here, which is 6 cross 6, I want to reduce the size by a factor of 2, then I'm just going to throw away every second column and every second row. And this is going to result in a uh, reduction of the uh, input by, uh, by a factor of 2. 
Now, so this down sampling layer simply drops down sampling by S, simply drops S minus one out of every S rows and S minus one out of every S columns. Now, so here's the operation, right? Uh, you'd need an index to keep track. You, you'd have to introduce new indices to keep track of the output index, but otherwise, uh, you're just sort of skipping. Uh, you, you are uh, skipping by size s and just reading. Right? So there's no extra operation that's being performed. You're just dropping s minus one of every s rows and columns. Now, typically, when we actually implement it, you wouldn't perform a computation followed by a downsampling. Downsampling is typically merged with the previous operation. So if you have a downsampling following a convolution operation, this is the same as performing convolution with a stride of s. If you have a, a downsampling following a pooling operation, this is the same as performing pooling with a stride of s. And so this is how we would actually implement it. So here, for example, if I want to scan and then downsample by a factor of two, Instead, I'm going to stride by two. So here, this would be my first output. And then I'm going to stride by two to get the next output. Then stride down by two to get the next output, right? So although I'm showing this as convolution with a stride of two, conceptually, the way you must think about it as a ray is as a regular convolution followed by a down sampling operation where you're dropping every second row and every second column. Because when you, if you try to, and this is particularly important when you're trying to train, and if you want to write down back propagation rules, if you want to write down the rules, the derivative rules for convolving with a stride, they are much more complicated than if you write down derivative rules for convolving with a stride of one, uh, followed by downsampling, as we will see when we begin speaking of back propagation. The other, so you know. Uh, if the input is n cross n and then you stride by s, the output size is now going to be n minus m over s plus one, right? So this pseudo code. Now, same thing with downsampling, right? With pooling, right? If you're going to be pooling and then downsampling, this is the same as striding when you perform your pooling operation. So again, it's convenient to think of this in terms of pooling with a stride of one followed by downsampling conceptually, because that actually changes how you're performing your back propagation. So this will be the same for me as well, right? What about increasing the size of the output? In this case, the idea still remains just the same. If I want to increase the size of the output by a factor of two, I'm just going to, or a factor of S in general, I'm just going to introduce S minus one rows and S minus one, col S minus, S minus one columns and S minus one rows between adjacent columns and adjacent rows. And now voila, the output has increased by a factor of S, very trivial, right? Nothing particularly fancy over here. And so this is an upsampling or dilation layer. Simply introduces S minus one rows and columns, effectively increases the size of the map by a factor of S in every direction. And this is used to explicitly to increase the map size by a uniform factor. Now, uh, this is also often called transpose convolution for various reasons, because people don't quite explain it in this trivial manner. How it is normally explained is like so, in that when you have an upsampling followed by a convolution, then you can combine the two and you know you, you end up with this so-called crazy transpose convolution operation, which uh, is not uh, no not highly interpretable if you look at it. But if you decompose it into an upsampling and a convolution operation, then uh, it's uh, much more understandable, right? So again, I have the upsampling code. Now, typically, you will not for follow an upsampling layer with a pooling layer because it doesn't make sense. What does it mean to pool zeros with your values, right? Uh, so upsampling is always followed by convolution. And if I'm upsampling by a factor s before convolving, the, this is often called convolution with a fractional stride. So if I'm upsampling by a factor two and then convolving, then this could be called convolution with by a factor, a convolution with a stride of 0.5, right? So, so Julio, can you turn your phone down, please? Okay. So here's a resampling summary. 
Map sizes can be changed by downsampling or upsampling. Uh, downsampling drops S minus one of S rows and columns. Upsampling inserts S minus one S rows, zeros between every two columns in rows, right? Downsampling typically follows convolution or pooling, and upsampling occurs before the convolution, right? That's about, yeah. Data do we, like, what, are we adding zeros? Just zeros. I mean, you could be doing smarter stuff with it, but uh, I like, you know, interpolating or whatever. But then you expect the model, if you're following this with a convolution, you're expecting the model to figure out how to interpolate, right? And it does the right thing. Questions? And so the story so far the convolutional neural network is a supervised uh, version of a computational model of a median version. It includes convolutional layers comprising learned filters that scan the outputs of the previous layer and pooling layers that are like motor groups of outputs from the convolution layers. Convolution can change the size of the output. This can be controlled by zero padding. And pooling layers can perform max, p norms, or be learned. Again, if pooling is done using a neural network, the parameters of the network are going to be learned. It could be just an MLP for pooling, right? Uh, and uh, yes. So there, there are settings. We can uh, go over this after class. But uh, uh, these days, most of the time, we don't even bother with max pooling. Pooling has generally been used as a way of reducing the size of the input. If you're just convolving with a stride, you get the same effect. But uh, pooling is generally used as a means of, uh, originally, pooling was introduced simply because this was a direct translation of Fukushima's model which had the C planes. And the idea was that it introduces some level of jitter invariance, and that in, in turn models what happens in our head. And that could, so uh, uh, strictly speaking, if you're performing mean pooling, for instance, mean pooling is just the same as a convolution, Okay, who's bronze tiger? Is bronze tiger around? Yes, please. Can you answer the first question? So, uh, which are the true statements? Up sampling by S and the fourth one. So the first and the fourth you said? No, the third and fourth. So actually, uh, upsampling by S introduces S minus one zeros with adjacent rows and columns. Okay, I think I should go back so the next guy gets a chance. <laughs> and upsampling layers are not followed by pooling layers. That's basically what we said, because if I'm performing max pooling, the zero either just you know kills values or becomes irrelevant, right? And then uh, upsampling layers are generally followed by convolutional layers. The uh, upsampling layers cannot can be combined with convolution or pooling layers. Upsampling cannot be combined with layers before them because it doesn't make sense, right? You can't be con convolving and upsampling or pooling and upsampling at the same time. They can only be combined with a convolution layer that follows. Now, who is the next pawn? That's red alligator. Who's red alligator? Yeah, okay. Uh, which are the right ones over here? For the second question, yeah. also to end for, is that right? Yeah. So down sampling by S replaces every S row and column with zeros. No, it just deletes them altogether, right? And it deletes S minus one consecutive rows and columns and only retains every S row and column. 
they usually merged with chord evolution or pulling layers after them. No, down sampling is not merged with things after them. Down sampling is merged with the layers before them. You just convert them to operations with a strut. So, so that's it. Any questions? If there are no questions, let's put it all together for a typical image classification task. Let's see how, uh, again, uh, this is kind of how CNNs were originally set up. So we're just going to go through this, right? Now, I'm going to assume max right? And your typical input is going to be a color image of this kind. When I have a color image, a color image is actually got three different images. It would have an R image, a G image, and a B image, or depending on the color, color map you use, right? CMI, CMYK, RGB, right? And so that picture to the left actually becomes these three pictures. And so you can think of these as three different planes, which I'm going to hear, I'm going to use the term channels. So you can think of them as three different channels of input, because the term channel is what is uh, commonly used. And so the input is three pictures, which I can stack into a cuboid with three layers, three channels, right? Now, the very first layer is going to comprise a bunch of filters, convolutional filters. Each of them will have a face of L cross L and a depth of three, because there are three channels. And the face can be five cross five or three cross three. Typically, these face sizes, they are small enough, because, because we are distributing the patterns across many layers, right? And or alternately speaking, we are building up the pattern uh, hierarchically over many, many layers. So uh, you want the smallest patterns to be small enough to capture fine detail. And so typically the filters are all going to be of the size uh, three cross three or five cross five or something of that kind. Now there's also the strange one cross one filter. What is a one cross one filter? Anybody? Mm -hmm. A one cross one filter is actually going to be taking all of these guys and computing a single value. It's like it's like an MLP, right? But this is the same as your non-distributed scan. Remember, when we were doing a non-distributed scan, what were we doing? We were reading one value from each map and computing an output, as opposed to looking at a region within a window. So one cross one filter is basically a non-distributed scan. You have one point and you're scanning with that point. Does that make sense? Right. OK. And so uh, you would have some number, k1 of these total filters. If I have k1 total filters, how many, how many channels or planes am I going to be computing? Anybody? OK, can everybody say K1? Yeah. Thank you. Right, you got it, you guys. <laughs> I have to make you do these strange things. Yes? Is everybody using the filter dimensions are usually odd? No, I just put them on. <laughs> so these are all empirically derived. I mean, you, you can, uh, they can be as large as 32 plus 32, depending on what you want to do, right? Uh, and then, so the parameters to choose are how many filters. What is the face of the filter and the stride? Typically for convolution, the stride would be one, unless you want to reduce the size of the output, right? And so the total number of parameters is going to be three L squared, L squared, because the face is L squared. There are three channels. So there are three channels. And then remember, you're an affine transform. An affine transform always has a bias. So the plus one comes from the bias, OK? And then. This is going to give us k1 of these output channels. Now, the way the computation is ever done, of course, is that within each channel, you first compute the affine value, which goes over the face of the filter and then goes through all of the channels. And then sums all of these terms up. And then once the affine value is computed, you actually apply an activation to it. You compute the output value. So, uh, the learnable parameters again, the first convolution layer has k1 filters of L, L cross L cross 3. The spatial span is L cross L. The depth is 3. So that's k1 times 3 L squared plus 1 parameters that we can learn. The plus 1 is, of course, the bias. After that, the next thing you would typically do is to have something like a pooling filter. So you'd be looking at some uh, P cross P blocks 
which should be which should be striding by some value d, right? And the way pull, if you're performing max pulling, what you would be doing is finding the index of the largest value within the block. And then once you have the index, the actual output is simply reading the uh, location. So here I've written it as a uh, single max operation. That's not what you do. Uh, you would actually have, you'd be finding the index and then reading the value of the value at the index of the largest value. And then again, for max pulling, the things you have to choose are what is the size of the window you're actually going to be performing max, max over and how much you're going to be striding by. So you, you, don't, you, may not, you don't necessarily have to stride by the width of the window. You could be striding by less. And so these are things that we could potentially decouple. There's the pooling operation and there's the shrinking operation. These are not necessarily coupled. Now, so after applying K1 filters, you're going to have K1 output channels in the first layer. Then after you perform a pooling with some stride, you're going to have K1 channels still, but the channels are all going to be shrunk by a dimensionality D on every side. Now, here is a simple question. Let's say, and so there's a little bit of arithmetic when you're actually performing the downsampling. Now, my input has, say, whatever, n cross n times three channels. So, how many variables do I have in all? In my input, over here, how many terms do I have? Guys, three and squared, right? So if I do not want to lose information, so from this, I get some K1 channels. And the K1 channels are all going to be approximately still N squared. So I'm, still, I'm going to get K1 N squared values once I've done my convolution. But then I do my pooling and down sampling. And then I'm going to get each of these is going to shrink in size. And so now this is going to be K1 N squared over D squared. That's how many terms I'm going to be left with, where D is the stride. Right? Mm -hmm. If I do not want to lose information about the input, what is the relationship between this guy and this guy? You want k1 over d squared to be greater than or equal to 3, otherwise I'm guaranteed to be losing information, right? So this tells me that if I'm shrinking by a factor d on every side, then the number of channels. So, you know, I can just say that k1 should be greater than or equal to 3d squared if I don't want to lose information. Does that make sense? Right. Pardon me? Can you repeat this part? Like, uh... Okay, so the input is 3n squared, right? The output after pooling has k1 channels, but each image is n squared over d squared because you're shrinking, right? So you're going to have k1 n squared over d squared. If I don't want to lose information, this number cannot be smaller than this number. Right? I have fewer terms. Otherwise, I have fewer terms coming out than what went in. Does that make sense? Right? So in other words, I want k1 n squared over d squared equals greater than or equal to 3 n squared. I can strike out the n squared. That gives me this value. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So in general, instead of 3, if I had k0 channels over here, going to need k0 d squared. So what does this tell us as you go through the this uh, situations where losing information would be desirable. If you've got noise and you want to begin cleaning things up for things like classification, yes, but more often than not these days when you're, you're trying to transform the data into some domain where the data are better represented without losing information. So what this really means as, is that as you go through the layers, they're going to make each of the channels smaller and smaller and smaller to compensate for it. 
you're going to, what are you going to have to do? Increase the, Increase the number of channels by a factor equal to what? The square of the uh, stride. Make sense to everybody? Yeah. Okay. So, and then once you're done with pulling, you'd have the next layer, which is also going to first, uh, you maybe have K2 filters over here. And K2, so the filters are now going to be, uh, so actually I'm calling this K2 channels. So you'd have K3 filters over here. So I'm just keeping the index, although K1 is going to be the same as K2 because after pulling the number of channels doesn't change, just on my slides. But then the filters over here is going, uh, the depth of the filters is going to be as much as the number of channels, right? And it's going to have its face. And those filters will be scanning the input. And then you get some affine transform. And so for this, the parameters you'd have to choose is once again, how many filters, what is the, what is the face, size of the face of the filter, uh, how much you're going to stride by, things like that. Again, these are design choices. And so here, the total number of parameters to be learned is going to be the number of channels here. And each filter is K2 times L squared. Uh, L3 squared is a, I call this L3, K2 times L3 squared, and they're going to be K3 of these guys. So you get the idea, the indices can get confusing. But again, the number of parameters is going to be the product of the size of the phase, the number of output channels, and the number of input channels. Plus one, right? And then this can be followed by pooling and so on. This can continue for any number of layers till you finally get your MLP. And the MLP actually performs the final classification. Now, the final for the final MLP, I'm going to take the output of all of the final convolution layers, flatten them up into one long vector, and then pass them through the MLP. Now, to train, so uh, basically, each convolution layer with a stride one maintains the size of the RP image with zero padding. And if performed without zero padding, you're already going to lose a little bit of information at the edges, which means that even if you're striding with one, you may have to increase the number of channels to make sure that you're not losing information at the boundaries, right? Uh, second, uh, each convolution layer will typically increase the number of maps from the previous layer. Why? Because pooling layer will not increase the number of maps, right? So the number of filters in any layer has to be greater than the number of channels in the previous layer. Otherwise, you're going to lose information if you have a stride of any kind or if you have any downsampling that follows. That makes sense? And now each pooling layer with stride B decreases the size of the maps by a factor of B on each side and filters within each layer. Now, typically you have different filters within each layer and all of them are generally of the same size. There's no requirement for this. Each channel could be computed by a filter of a different size for all you care. But for purposes of efficiency, we just make them all the same size, right? So if one of them is three cross three, all of them are gonna be three cross three. And so here are all the parameters that you choose, design choices, the number of convolution and non sampling layers, uh, the order in which they follow one another. And for each convolution layer, the number of filters and the spatial extent of the filter. And the depth of the filter, of course, is the number of channels in the previous layer. For the pooling layers, you're going to look at the extent of the pooling phase and what is the structure. And then for the final MLP, you'd have to decide how many layers and uh, what kind of activations and such like. So, Okay, uh, T Panther, what is the answer? Who's T Panther? Absent. Okay. Who's Scarlet Falcon? Scarlet Falcon? Scarlet Falcon is. 
Who is emerald turtle? Emerald turtle is also absent. Okay, nice. And who is gold wolf? Uh, yes. the, the first one is the first one. Is right. So I'm talking about this in terms of filters and channels and such like, but then this is, we are still speaking of the scanning MLP, right? And so the number of filters in any channel is basically the same as the number of neurons in the scanning MLP. So just to connect up with what we spoke of in the previous class. We are basically speaking of the same thing. Thank you. So uh, here are the settings that uh, Lekun had for his digit classifier. You had some input, then the initial filters were five cross five, uh, had a face of five cross five, then he had, uh, I think they had uh, four of those. Then he had a uh, down sampling max pooling layer, which reduced it by a factor of two. Then he had 10 five cross five filters afterwards, and then a pooling layer which reduced it by another size of two, and then he had a whole MLP. It's a very simple network and performed extraordinarily well, given the complexity of the network. So fine, we've sort of seen how the whole thing works. How do you train it? We're gonna spend all of the next class talking about training, but just to set up the uh, framework. The training, remember, although it's, I'm speaking in terms of convolutions and such like, it's still scanning with an MLP, right? So training is going to be no different than when you actually, uh, uh, trained with an MLP. So that person on the corner, can you turn off your phone, please? I'm serious. I do not want you guys looking at your phone in class. You're welcome to do so. Go outside and do it. So uh, now this is the same as an MLP, right? The only difference is in the structure of the network. So I'm going to be giving you examples of images and classes. That's your training data. And uh, You'd have to define a divergence between the desired and actual outputs, and the network parameters are going to be trained through gradients and gradients, and gradients are computed through back propagation. So all of these parameters are going to be the parameters you can learn. The parameters of the final MLP and all of the filters for all of the layers. Right? So uh, here's what I will do. Now just pass again. Uh, I'm going to be passing inputs through the network. And the network is going to have some output. Then I'd have a desired output for the network for that particular input. I can compute a divergence between the two. So as before, my loss is going to be the average divergence over my trading data. I'm going to be using gradient descent to estimate all of my, to learn all of my parameters, which means that uh, I'm going to need to compute the derivative of this loss with respect to each of my parameters, this guy. And the derivative of the loss, of course, is going to be the average of the derivative of the divergence is for the individual instances. So we're going to have to learn this guy, which means we, we're going right back to where we were. We have to figure out how to compute the derivative of the divergence for each individual instance with respect to all network parameters. And so things proceed just as before. I, give, I start with an input. The input is going to be passed through the network, through all the convolution and pooling layers. And after the final layer of convolution or pooling, whatever the comes last, I'm going to take all of those outputs, which are still arranged in them in, in channels and planes. They look, they look like maps. I would flatten them out into a single long vector. And then the flattened, layer, flattened vector is going to be passed through an MLP. And the MLP would have some output. Now, I can compute the divergence between that output and the desired output. And we know exactly how to perform back propagation through an MLP. So which means that I can now perform back propagation out here and move it back all the way to the first layer of the MLP. Yeah. Uh, so there's a question in uh, uh, Zoom. Uh, is it right that each neuron contains all the filters for each channel of the given layer? Meaning, I'm not sure exactly what that question means. So a neuron is computing a single output ch channel, and e a neuron is basically the weights of a neuron comprise a single filter. And they're going to be considering all of the input channels. 
check if they got the answer or not, right? So if I were thinking, so this guy here, this neuron is going to have weights corresponding to all of the input channels. And each neuron is going to be one of these, correspond to one of these output channels. So anyway, using backdrop, I can compute derivatives all the way to the input of the first layer of the MLP. And this is easy, just the simple rules that we saw so far, right? Uh, now, again, the key to remember is that the first layer of the MLP is simply a flattening of the final layer of co convolution. So if I went through many convolution layers, the final layer of convolution is going to give me a collection of maps of this kind. And so I take all of these values and flatten them out into a single vector. So when I compute the derivatives going backwards with respect to all of these terms, these derivatives can now be folded back and now I am going to have derivatives with respect to the output. Every element of every output channel of the final convolving or scanning layer. And now once I have those, all I have to do is to figure out how to now perform the back propagation going back through this, these, these layers, these convolutional and scanning layers to account for the fact that it's the same, uh, essentially the same neuron scanning the entire input. And we will deal with that in the next class. Questions? Have you decide the filters? Like, what filters? The filters are done, right? Oh, for every filter number, the the weights are learned. So you mean the size? No, the, the filter values. Like how do you decide the filter values? Like the filter values. So again, the filter values are just the weights, right? So over here, this filter. When I'm speaking of a filter, uh, this is the terminology that one kind of has to get used to. So if this guy is looking at all of these regions, this is my filter. And the weights corresponding to all of these are what you're going to be learning. The only thing that you specify is what is the size of this one. So I have, for example, I have these, if I go back to my slides, here, and that many, 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 which is, just give me a, so over here, the filter is this, well, it's a long way back, right? That's my filter, the thing to the right, right? So those are my filters. Those colors represent values. Those are going to be learned. The only thing that you specify is what is the size, three cross three or whatever. Did that answer your question? Anything else? No. Thank you, guys. Thank you.